Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Basilica, the National Shrine of the Little Flower. Uh, we thank you for joining us this morning for this installment of our Carmelite Lecture Series. Uh, this year, we're focusing on different aspects of the life and spirituality of St. Therese, our patroness. And we're very pleased to welcome this morning as our presenter, Father John Magdalene Sinram. Uh, Father John hails originally from Kansas and uh, joined the Carmelites uh, in 1979. Uh, he made his profession as a discount Carmelite in 1980 and was ordained a priest in 1987 here at the Basilica. And uh, after his ordination, Father John spent a year in Avila, Spain, uh, kind of the birthplace of our Discalced Carmelite Order to study uh, the spirituality of especially St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa. Uh, he has served many years as pastor here at Little Flower, and it was uh, and during that time he uh, attended the general chapter, kind of the once every six years international congress of the Carmelite Friars, and in 1997, it was in, held in Lisieux, France, for the centenary of the death of St. Therese, and Father John was there, met the Carmelite nuns uh, of Lisieux. It was under his leadership and initiative that uh, our church uh, was elevated to the status of basilica. Uh, in 1998, 1998, um, and also under his leadership that uh, the work was done downstairs uh, and, the, the, and uh, led to the opening of our St. Elias Adoration Chapel, which, please God, will have back open soon. Um, currently, uh, Father John is, serves as on our provincial council for the semi-province of St. Therese, and is the superior of our Mount Carmel Center in Dallas. So we welcome you, Father John. Thank you for being with us today. And so. You shouldn't clap now, you might change your mind later. <laughs> oh, I'm happy to be here today with you. Uh, so that uh, we can consider an aspect of uh, the spirituality of St. Therese. <clears throat> She's really a stellar figure in the life of the church. Uh, she's someone who um, is a doctor of the church, and part of the reason that she's a doctor of the church is because of the advancement of teaching that she made in regard to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, so what we're doing today is just kind of considering her life. <clears throat> Historically, is speaking about aspects of... Uh, of the communion of life between herself and the Blessed Virgin Mary, bringing out various aspects of her understanding of the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the life of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> well, Mary said, all generations will call me blessed, and certainly, that's still happening. All generations, one following the other, calls her blessed. These saints and angels uh, are active in veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary in heaven. It's not surprising that St. Therese, being a saint, would be devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary Therese learned to uh, venerate the Blessed Virgin Mary very early in her life. Uh, she was in a home where Mary was given a very special place. 
Um, I suppose that most of us here know the outlines of St. Therese's life. She was born in 1873 in Alençon in France to a couple by the name of Louis and Zélie Martin, whose home was a place where the Blessed Virgin Mary was greatly honored. Uh, Louis Martin was himself devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary when he was an apprentice watchmaker living in Paris. He would often visit the shrine of Our Lady of Victories. And they say if he was conversing with people and speaking about Jesus, he would always say, Our Lord and his Blessed Mother. <clears throat> Zelly, Therese's mom, was also a devotee of Mary. She prayed again and again to the Blessed Virgin, especially in times of deepest need. <clears throat> For instance, when she needed to get together a dowry for her marriage and when she was looking for a husband and when she desired a child or when a child was sick and so forth, she would go to the Blessed Virgin Mary and ask for her intercession. Uh, when Therese was born, her sister Marie was 12, Pauline, an older sister, was 11, Leonie was 9, and Celine was 3. The youngest in the family would be named Marie Francois Therese. And you could say that Mary was the queen of the Martin household. A statue of Mary would take pride of place in the home. It had been given to Louis by a woman who had helped him financially to get his watch making business started in Alençon. The statue represented Mary under the title of Our Lady of Victories. The statue portrays Mary as the new Eve or the Immaculate Conception. She has a very slight, gentle smile on her face as she holds her arms open in a gesture of welcoming. She's treading on a serpent. Her hair is tied back and there's no veil. Her hair is tied back. Why so? Well, she's represented as a peasant girl, as a poor girl. <clears throat> so you could almost say that the statue of Our Lady of Victories that they had was the center of life in Therese's home. Shortly after a child was born into the family, the child would be taken uh, to that statue and there the child would be dedicated or venerated or uh, not really consecrated, we shouldn't use that word, but anyway, she would be dedicated by her parents to the Blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> so, uh, so the first child that Zelie and Louis had would be named Marie, after the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the other children and each child, because they were all girls, would be given a second name of Mary or Marie. So as I said, Therese was named Marie Francois Therese. And her mother offered Therese the Blessed Virgin Mary's care under the title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and the Visitation. So the family would gather around the statue for morning and evening prayers. The children would be encouraged to make up a prayer of special homage to Mary. During the month of May, Mary's month, the family would decorate around the statue and add candles and flowers. At Christmas time, their nativity set would be near the statue. So Therese was born January the 2nd of 1873, and less than five years later, when Therese was four, her mother Zelie died of cancer. And losing her mother was a cruel blow to Therese's psyche. <clears throat> it's said that her character changed from someone who was vivacious and playful to someone who was timid and meek and sensitive. 
Therese asked her older sister Marie to act as her mother, and that brought her some consolation, but she referred the next eight years of her life after her mother's death as, quote, the saddest years of my life. Well, Therese uh, had one experience at the age of five that kind of lifted her spirits that was associated with the Virgin Mary. She made her first confession when she was five, and the priest who heard her confession encouraged her to have a special love for Mary, the mother of God. Therese says in her autobiography, I remember the exhortation with which he then urged me above all to a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and I promised to redouble my, to redouble my affection. Um, I promised to redouble my affection to her and who now held such an important place in my heart. And then I handed my rosary to have him bless it and left the confessional so free and happy I can say I had never before in my life experienced such joy. Pauline, uh, the sister whom Therese had chosen as her second mother, decided to enter the Carmelite convent when Therese was nine. And this caused Therese very great distress, so much so that she says she shed bitter tears. <clears throat> Now, Therese's sickness of heart began to affect her more and more deeply. She started to have pains and convulsions and was often in a state of delirium. She was drowsy and her thoughts were confused. Art, you could help me. Why don't you bring me that chair over there? Therese's sickness became more severe as time went on but at times when she was when it was less severe or when her sickness was less severe there you go. okay thanks at times when her sickness was less severe she speaks of how quote it was my delight to weave garlands of daisies and forget-me-nots for our lady's statue <clears throat> So Therese was going through this trial, and this is how she speaks of it. We were then in the beautiful month of May when all of nature was adorned with flowers of springtime. Only the little flower, that's the name that her father gave to her, huh? only the little flower was languishing and seemed destined to die. That is until she received sunlight from above. And that sunlight was the miraculous statue of heaven, end of quote. So here, 1880, 1883, Therese is languishing. Her illness, instead of improving, just gets worse. And so her father, Louis, asked Marie to have a novena of masses said at the shrine of Our Lady of Victories in Paris. And on Pentecost Sunday, May the 13th of 1883, during that novena of masses, Therese was suffering terribly. She was writhing in pain, and she was so delirious that she couldn't even recognize the members of her family. And something spectacular happened. She was in bed, and she looked at the statue. This is the way she recounts it. <clears throat> Finding no help on earth, I entreated her with all my heart to have pity on me. Suddenly the statue became animated and radiantly beautiful. Her gracious smile penetrated to the depths of my soul. All my pain vanished. Therese had been cured. The next historical event in Therese's life that had a special Marian character happened a year after Therese's cure, her first communion day, May the 8th of 1884. <clears throat> so to prepare for the first communion, the children of the parish in Alençon made a three-day retreat, and on the vigil of her first communion day, Therese was chosen to recite an act of consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
This is what she says. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> I pronounce the act of consecration of the Blessed Virgin in the name of my companions. Doubtless I was chosen for this because I was left without my mother on earth. In consecrating myself to the Virgin Mary, I asked her to watch over me, place, placing into the act all the devotion of my soul. And it seemed to me I saw her once again looking down and smiling on her little flower. And later she would say to a Benedictine nun in a letter she wrote, I cannot doubt that the special grace of my religious vocation took deep root on that happy day when I read my consecration at the altar of the Blessed Virgin Mary and chose her more particularly as my heavenly mother on the morning that I received Jesus for the first time. <clears throat> and in the days preceding her first communion, she recited a prayer. It went like this. O my beloved mother, I confide to your care the little garden of my heart. Come to sow in it beautiful flowers of desires and acts which will be a cradle of love for Jesus. And, and she would also pray. O sweet Virgin Mary, it is under your maternal eyes that I desire to make my heart a cradle of lilies for the coming of Jesus into my soul. So from the day of her first communion, Therese pledged to say the memorari, the prayer of the memorari daily. And I would encourage all of you to do the same. On May the 31st of 1887, Therese was admitted into the sodality of Mary at her school. At that time, she composed a prayer, commending herself to Blessed Mother. It went like this. O Mary conceived without sin, wishing to place myself under your spiritual protection, I choose you this day for my patroness, my advocate, my mistress, my mother. I make a firm resolution to do all in my power to procure your glory, to propagate your devotion. <clears throat> so Therese had had several sisters that entered the convent, and she decided at a very young age that she was going to enter Mary's order. She was going to enter Carmel. She wanted with all her heart to enter the Carmelite convent just like her older sisters. Carmel is Mary's order. In fact, when the first Carmelites established their way of life on Mount Carmel, above the Port of Haifa in the Holy Land, they called themselves the Brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. Ours was the first order that dedicated itself to the Blessed Virgin Mary in this way. Huh? So Therese had deep desires to enter Carmel, and she wanted to enter at the early age of 15. She was 14 now, but she was afraid to tell her father of her plans. Why? Because everybody else had gone to the convent, and he'd be all alone. All right, so she, she felt really badly about the possibility of leaving her father. Uh, but she was, uh, so it's, it's kind of off topic, but let's review for a minute what she said about what happened when she decided to tell her father, Louis, of her plans. She's 14 and a half. The Feast of Pentecost was coming up, so she decided to tell him on that feast day. This is how she tells the story. <clears throat> I chose the Feast of Pentecost as the day to break the news all day long begging the apostles to pray for me, to inspire me with the right words. I found the opportunity to speak to my dear little father only in the afternoon after Vespers. He was seated by the well, contemplating the marvels of nature in his hand, with his hands joined. 
Papa's handsome face had a heavenly expression about it, giving me the feeling that peace flooded his heart. Without saying a word, I sat down by his side, my eyes already wet with tears. He gazed at me tenderly, and taking my head, he placed it on his heart, saying, What is the matter, my little queen? Tell me. Then, rising as though to hide his own emotion, he walked while still holding my head to his heart. Through my tears, I confided my desire to enter Carmel, and soon his tears mingled with mine. He didn't say one word to turn me from my vocation, simply contenting himself with the statement that I was still very young to make such a serious decision. I defended myself so well that with Papa's simple and direct character, he was soon convinced my desire was God's will, and in his deep faith he cried out that God was giving him a great honor in asking his children from him. We continued our walk for a long time, and encouraged by the kindness with which my incomparable father received my confidences, my heart poured out itself to him. That's when he gave her a little flower. Huh? He plucked it from the wall. It came out with the roots and all, and he gave it to her. Well, he said, look at this little flower. It was hidden in the wall. No one would have seen it unless we passed by here. But God clothed it with such great beauty. Therese, you will grow in the Garden of Carmel. And so forth and so on. You will be God's little flower. So... <clears throat> Uh, Teresa told her father, but she wanted to enter at 15. If she was going to enter at 15, she get, had to get her permi the permission of her uncle, and she had to get the permission of the bishop. And it was very unlikely. In fact, they went to the bishop, and she was turned down. It's not that he didn't receive her well or anything like that, but he told her she was too young. And so what did they decide to do? They'd go to Rome and talk to the Holy Father and see if he would allow it. <clears throat> so they went on a pilgrimage to Rome and uh, one of the places that they stopped on their pilgrimage to Rome was in Paris. What was in Paris? That shrine of Our Lady of Victories that has the original statue of Our Lady of the Smile. So uh, they stopped at uh, the Chapel of Our Lady of Victories, and uh, she says of some, uh, about this, about the experience she had. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I was always subject to allergies when I was in this place. <laughs> what a bit. Okay. <clears throat> so she said, Ah, what I felt kneeling at her feet, I cannot be expressed. The graces she granted me so moved me that my happiness found expression only in tears, just as on the day of my first communion. The Blessed Virgin made me feel it was really herself who smiled on me and brought about my cure. And so she was convicted that the cure that she had received had taken place through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> I understood she was watching over me, that I was her child. I could no longer give her any other name than Mama, as this appeared ever so much more tender than Mother. How fervently I begged her to protect me always, to bring to fruition as quickly as possible my dream of hiding beneath the shadow of her virginal mantle. This is one of my first desires as a child. When, I, when growing up, I understood it was at Carmel, I would truly find the Blessed Virgin Mary's mantle, and towards this fertile mount, I directed all my desires. And Therese uh, uh, compared the experience that she had there in a way, to the experience that she had on her first communion day. 
she said it was like the day of my first communion. What happened on the day of her first communion? She said, Therese and Jesus had known each other for a long time, but now they were one. Now there was a fusion between Jesus and herself. And to some extent, that's the experience that she had when she went to Our Lady of Victories, that there was a com deep communion of life between herself and the Blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> so this experience on, the, on her pilgrimage convinced Therese first that Mary had indeed healed her, and also she understood Mary's deep love for her was the love of a mama. So Therese could surrender herself to Mary with childlike confidence. Well, by hook and by crook, they, they, she talked to the Holy Father, even though she was not supposed to, and, and asked him if she could enter Carmel. He said, you will if, if it is God's will. Well, and they returned, lo and behold, the way opened up for her to enter Carmel when she was 15. <clears throat> so after Therese entered Carmel in April of 1888, her love for the Blessed Virgin Mary increased as she was being led interiorly to model her life on the Virgin Mary's humility and faith. And then a little more than a year after Therese entered Carmel, during what we call her novitiate year, she had another experience of her mama's love. She was outside praying in the little grotto of St. Mary Magdalene. This is in the convent now, in the cloister garden. Huh? She was outside praying in the little grotto of St. Mary Magdalene. And like Father Gregory said, I've been there. So the little grotto is really small. It, it's, about, it's, about, it's about half the size of that pew and extends out about 12 feet or something like that. So it's very small, huh? All right. So <clears throat> and there was a statue nearby, a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she looked over at the statue, and she entered into a rapture of sorts. She was absorbed in God. And later she would tell... Uh, <clears throat> Mother Agnes, the prioress. It was as if a veil had been thrown over me, hiding the things of earth. I seemed to be entirely hidden beneath the veil of the Blessed Virgin. At the time, I had charge of the refectory, and I performed my actions as if with a borrowed body. I remained in this state for an entire week. Therese made her profession of vows on uh, September the 8th of 1890 on the feast day of the birth of Mary. And she said of it, it was a perfect feast to, to become the spouse of Jesus. So, uh, Therese said that even the name of Mary would, would kind of elevate her heart, huh? Uh, on uh, October the 19th of 1892, she wrote to her sister Celine, God is mine and the mother of God also my mother. Something I find myself saying to her, that is to Mary. Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, dear mother, you know, dear mother, that I am happier than you. I have you for a mother. Whereas you do not have the Blessed Virgin, you do not have the Blessed Virgin to love. <laughs> I, poor creature, am not, am not your servant. I am your daughter. You are the mother of Jesus and my mother too. 
And in an outburst of love, she said, Oh Mary, if I were queen of heaven and you were Therese, I would wish to be Therese to see you queen of heaven. And actually, those were the last words written by St. Therese three weeks before her death. O oh Mary, if I were queen of heaven and you were Therese, I would wish to be Therese to see you queen of heaven. So at time of trouble, she would turn to the Virgin. Uh, when there was difficulty within the convent, she turned to the Virgin. Uh, when she needed to come up with advice to give to the novices, when she was novice mistress, she would often turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, especially at her time of receiving First Communion, she would ask for the Blessed Virgin Mary's help. <clears throat> You know, Therese did not have elevated experiences, generally, through her life. She did not have elevated experiences during her Thanksgiving after communion. And, and so what she would do was pray, ask the Blessed Virgin Mary, since she knew that she was unworthy and sinful, just like we all are, to prepare a place in her heart for Jesus to come. <clears throat> so uh, she said this, at the moment of communion, I sometimes imagine my soul, I imagine my soul as a child of three or four years who has just come in from play, hair disheveled and clothes disorderly and soiled. These are the injuries that I meet in combating with souls. As she's praying for souls, she says, you know, I get soiled and so forth and so on. I get tired. My clothes get disheveled. Then comes the Blessed Virgin and in a moment makes me respectable looking and fit to assist at the banquet of the angels without shame. There are many occasions in her letters when uh, she speaks about uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Oh. To a, one of the missionaries that uh, she was dedicated to and wrote to during her time in the convent. She said, because he was worried, he was worried that he was going to have to uh, pass through purgatory and probably spend eons there, or whatever, huh? So she responded to his, his misgivings about his life and so forth and so on by saying, how can God purify in the flames of purgatory souls consumed in the fires of divine love? Of course, no human life is free from faults. Only the Immaculate Virgin presents herself in absolute purity before God's majesty. What a joy to remember that she is our mother. Since she loves us and knows our weakness, what do we have to fear? It seems to me that all missionaries are martyrs by desire and will, and that in consequence, not one should go to purgatory. If at the moment they appear before God, some traces of human weakness remain in their souls, the Blessed Virgin obtains for them the grace to make an act of perfect love and then gives them the palm and the crown they have truly merited. Now we turn to uh, the last days before her death. Now she was sick for a long time with tuberculosis and she was taken to the infirmary during Holy Week of 1896. She had the first flow of blood 
from her lungs. But uh, she was not, uh, not taken to the infirmary until July of the following year. So we're talking about a year and three months or, or so forth when she was suffering very, very seriously from tuberculosis before she died. It was also a night of faith for her. <clears throat> so she was taken to the infirmary and she herself spoke about how on coming into the infirmary, her first glance rested on the miraculous statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary that they had brought to the convent to keep her company. Uh, so uh, in the final weeks before her death, she gave expression to some of the noblest sentiments about the mother of God. One day she was heard to say, how I love the Blessed Virgin Mary. If I had been a priest, how I should have spoken of her. She is sometimes described as unapproachable, whereas she should be represented as easy of imitation. She is more mother than queen. I have, I have heard it said that her splendor eclipses that of all the saints as the rising sun makes all the stars disappear. It sounds so strange, she said that a mother should take away the glory of her children. I think quite the reverse. I believe that she will greatly increase the splendor of the elect, our Mother Mary. How simple her life must have been. <clears throat> uh, most of us know she made an oblation to merciful love uh, that took place on June the 9th of 1895. It was Trinity Sunday. And she offered herself as a victim to merciful love. <clears throat> and unlike some people in her day who were offering themselves to God as a victim so that God's justice might smite them <laughs> and whittle them down and so forth and so on, and destroy them. Huh? Instead of that perspective, Therese offered herself as a victim to merciful love. What was that about? It was about opening herself to love because there were so many people who weren't opening themselves to love. She would open herself to merciful love in the various widest place way, way possible in communion with the sufferings of Jesus, yes. She would offer herself just as widely as she possibly could to merciful, merciful love so that through her, merciful love might be extended into the world. And that's still happening. Most of you have probably had experience of her intercession. Okay, so uh, uh, she made that oblation to merciful love at the feet of that statue of Our Lady of Victories. <clears throat> Finally, on the morning of September the 30th, she told the sisters that the last night had been her last night on earth. <clears throat> And she added, she said, how fervently I have prayed to Our Lady, and yet it has been pure agony without any ray of consolation. Towards three o'clock in the afternoon, they say she was seized with a convulsion that shook her whole body, and she opened her arms in the form of, of a cross. And her superior uh, placed an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary on her lap. And uh, she looked at it for a moment. And then she said, Mother, that is Mother Mary, 
Mother, recommend me quick. Oh, no, excuse me. She was speaking to her sister. Mother, the mother prioress, Mother, recommend me quickly to the Blessed Virgin. Prepare me for a happy death. And three hours later, as the monastery bell was ringing out the Angelus, with her eyes firmly fixed on the Blessed Mary's statue, Therese passed into eternity. So in the second uh, part of the presentation, we talked about Therese's life and the Blessed Virgin Mary, various experiences that she had, <clears throat> various self-offerings that she made to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to Jesus in this second part of the uh, presentation. We're going to speak about St. Therese's teaching. We're going to speak about her doctrine. Uh, she has very, very significant teaching. Uh, she is a doctor of the church. Uh, she presents her teaching in a very simple style. So it's easy for some people to kind of overlook it as if it doesn't have as much significance as uh, some other doctrine. But truly, Therese has been radiant in her understanding, especially of, of Marian theology as drawn from Scripture. An understanding of Mary is drawn from Scripture. <clears throat> You know, since the time of Vatican II, I'm talking about the mid-1960s here, uh, since the time of Vatican II, that ecumenical council that took place where all the bishops came together and met in groups over a, period, a long period of time, teaching was given to the world. This teaching was... Uh, a matter of updating, not changing in any way, uh, not giving new teaching necessarily, huh? but presenting the doctrine of the church in a way that modern man and modern woman could come to understand it and in a way in which people could, people who did not even have faith or people who lacked understanding of the Catholic Church, could grow in their understanding of the Catholic Church as, as, as a form of dialogue that the Church would teach her children and the children of the earth and invite them to uh, an understanding of the Church and of er various elements of Church life. One of the central elements of life in the Catholic Church is devotion of the Blessed Virgin Mary that is based on Scripture. All generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Truly God did great things for Mary and he wants her to be known and loved by us. And so God has lifted raised up particular teachers over the course of the history of the Catholic Church to bring us riches from the treasures of the tradition of the Church to develop teaching about the Blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> and one of the things that Vatican II did was a return to the sources, a return to the sources. Uh, the early traditional sources of doctrine that we have, but more than that, return to this, the source of Scripture itself. Uh, St. Therese, then, would be someone who actually anticipated and developed 
uh, anticipated the teaching of Vatican II on the Blessed Virgin Mary and developed our understanding of the Blessed Virgin Mary in our life. So, <clears throat> in the time before Vatican II, the general way of speaking about Mary was that, yeah, she was like a sun that eclipsed all the stars. She was, she is the most perfect creature, there's no doubt about that. Um, the tendency was to elevate Mary and put her on a pedestal so high indeed, huh? so high indeed that sometimes she eclipsed Jesus in people's understanding. Or there was almost like instead of a, there was a quaternity instead of a trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Mary. But, uh, so Therese helped us to understand the place of Mary in the church. The place of Mary in salvation history. The place of Mary as mother in the church. The place of Mary as, as someone that her children can approach with great confidence, trusting in her merciful, motherly love for us. So, in Therese's time then, the tendency was to over-elevate the Blessed Virgin Mary, over, or kind of to over-exaggerate her privileges, over-exaggerate her special uh, character, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> well, in a time then that often stressed Mary's special privileges and promoted Marian devotions that were often based on private revelations and apocryphal stories, Therese returned to the Mary of the Gospels, the Mary of the Gospels and of ordinary experience. She said, I must see her real life, not her imagined life. I'm sure that her real life was very simple. They show her as unapproachable, but they should present her to us as imitable, as someone we can imitate. We know very well that the Blessed Virgin is Queen of Heaven and Earth, but she is more mother than queen. So it came to be recognized after Teresa's death that uh, she really had something to contribute to the life of the church. It took some time, but eventually, in the year 1997, it was recognized, Therese was elevated to this status as doctor of the church. Uh, it was recognized that she had a special mission of showing us what it was like to live an ordinary life of faith to show us how important it was to have confidence, confidence, confidence in the merciful love of God. Um, to show, to, to lead us, to lead us to love Jesus as God the Father desired that he might be loved. 
And so in uh, the apostolic letter that declared the doctorate of St. Therese, the name of the letter was Divini Amoris Scientia, the science of divine love, written by John Paul II. <clears throat> This is what John Paul said. She, that is Therese, has made the gospel shine appealingly in our time. She had the mission of making the church, the mystical body of Christ, known and loved. She helped to heal souls of the rigors and fears of Jansenism, which tended to stress God's justice rather than his divine mercy. In God's mercy, she contemplated and adored all the divine perfections because she said even his justice, and perhaps even more so than the other perfections, seems to be clothed in love, end of quote. Thus she became a living icon of that God who, according to the church's prayer, shows his almighty power in mercy and forgiveness. Shows his mighty power in mercy and forgiveness. And, uh, and going on, he will say that even though Therese does not have a true and proper doctrinal corpus, that is, she doesn't have volumes of theology that she's left for the church or anything like that. Uh, she doesn't have intellectual treatises that are logically developed from point to point to point to point and so forth and so on. We don't have a development of of theology in a uh, necessarily logical form. Um, so, but he said, even though she does not have a true and proper doctrinal course, corpus, nevertheless, a particular radiance of doctrine shines forth from her writings, which as if by a charism of the Holy Spirit, grasps the very heart of the message of revelation in a fresh and original vision presenting a teaching of eminent quality. So the core of Therese's message is the message of divine love. God's love, the triune love of God, um, all the other aspects of the life of God, all the other characteristics of God's life are organized by love. Merciful love is at the summit of the life of the three-personed God, the Trinity. Um, so, uh, another quote. <clears throat> Through spiritual childhood, one experiences that everything comes from God, returns to him, and abides in him for the salvation of all in the mystery of merciful love. Such is the doctrinal message taught and lived by this saint. <clears throat> but at the end of his, his, his document, he talks about Therese, and what we call Maryology, the study of Mary, Therese and the theology of Mary. He says, lastly, <clears throat> among the original chapters, there's a new teaching here, huh? Lastly, among the most original chapters of her spiritual doctrine, we must recall Therese's wise delving into the mystery and journey of the Virgin Mary, achieving results very close to the doctrine of the Second Vatican Council in chapter eight 
of the Constitution, Lumen Gentium, and to what he says I myself taught in the encyclical letter Redemptoris Mater of Jun March the 25th of 1987. So that's uh, John Paul II at the time of the Declaration of the Doctorate <clears throat> telling us that Therese has a, another chapter, another chapter of doctrine, another chapter of teaching to give to the church about the significance of the Blessed Virgin Mary in our life. And what is original about it? What is original about it is that it's a return to the scriptures. It's a presentation of Mary of the scriptures. She said they should present her to us as simple. They should present her to us as a person of faith. That is the way the Vatican II has presented the Blessed Mother to us as someone like us, as someone who is greatly, greatly gifted by God, very highly favored by God, but at the same time, someone who made a pilgrimage of faith during her life, someone who experienced suffering, someone who experienced misunderstanding, someone who had times of spiritual darkness, as we all do. Mary is like us. If Jesus is like us in all things but sin, guess what? Mary's like us in all things too. Except she doesn't have sin either. Sorry about that. <laughs> she was immaculately conceived. So, uh, but she can still identify with us. She's the mother of sinners as well. Okay, so I was speaking about John Paul II, the Declaration of the Doctorate. At the turn of the new millennium, or just after the new millennium had begun in March of, uh, <clears throat> actually a, a year after, March of 2001, uh, John Paul II gave a, an address to the people of the world about Mary as the star of the new millennium. In other words, if we were going to move through the new millennium, that we needed to look to Mary as Stella Maris, as the star of the sea, as someone who could illuminate our lives, our lives of faith, but someone who we should imitate and follow. So Mary as the star of the millennium, and in, uh, in this address, this is something that uh, is in parallel with Teresa's spirituality, which speaks about how Mary is more mother than queen, about how Mary is truly our mama, someone who is approachable, and so forth and so on. So... Um, here, John Paul II speaks about the new maternity of Mary, the new motherhood of Mary that took place when Mary was given to John, the beloved disciple, on Calvary. We remember the scene, right? Jesus is on the cross. He turns to John, the beloved disciple. John represents all of us. He's the beloved disciple because he's the one who has faith and love for Christ. The one who is there. Huh? He is the beloved disciple because he has faith and love. He turns to John and says, Son, behold your mother. And to his mother he says, Woman, woman, behold your son. So that's what John Paul says about that. <clears throat> In the beginning of the, of the address, he's talking about Mary as someone who went on this pilgrimage of faith, right? <clears throat> he says, uh, 
the end of this earthly pilgrimage. At the end of this earthly pilgrimage in faith is called Golgotha, where Mary lives intimately the Paschal mystery of the Son. In a certain sense, she dies as mother. She dies as mother in the death of her son and opens to the resurrection with a new maternity in the life of the church. Dying as mother, being reborn as mother for the whole church. And we can understand how this could have happened like at Pentecost, okay? We see the difference between the, the apostles before and after the Holy Spirit came down upon the church. Before the Holy Spirit came down on the apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary in the upper room, Peter was a fearful man. And these other guys around him were simple fishermen. Where did they get the capacity to be able to write gospels? How did they do that? They can only do that thanks to the gifts of the Holy Spirit that were given to them at Pentecost. And as for Mary, what sort of a charism did she receive? What sort of special gifts of the Holy Spirit did she receive? She certainly received this gift of a new maternity, a deepening of her new maternity, being mother not just of one child, but of all the children of the earth. So in a certain sense, she dies as mother in the death of her son, and opens to the resurrection with a new maternity in the life of the church. Um, okay, I, I'm going to refer to uh, another figure whose name is Kiara Lubick, whose name was Kiara Lubick, she's dead now. <clears throat> Kiara Lubick was the foundress of an apostolic movement in the Catholic Church, which is also ecumenical. In other words, it reaches out to, to, to Protestants, other Christians. This, this movement is called Focolare, and it reaches out to Protestants, and it reaches out to other religions as well, and it invites everyone to come together in love. Its mission, Focolari's mission, is to further the work of Jesus. And what did Jesus desire for us? He prayed to the Father and he said, Father, may they all be one as you are in me, and I am in you, may they be so completely one that the world might know that you have sent me. So the mission of Focolare is to bring people together in love and accomplish the mission of the church, accomplish uh, the, the fulfillment of the commandment of Christ for unity. <clears throat> So these people who belong to the movement, but I mean, you know, this is, this is our general vocation too, but anyway, the people who belong to the movement are very dedicated to discerning, being aware that where two or three people come together in Christ's name, he is truly there in their midst. He is truly with them. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, Jesus would say. 
So to be aware of that, though, if we are in communion of life with one another, real communion, huh? What's it mean? He's, Jesus is here. How's he here? He's here in this human rapport, in this love that we have for one another. He's truly there in, in that uh, experience. And where does Mary fit into this experience? Well, she is mother of the church. How did, how did she become mother of the church? By standing at the foot of the cross of her son and suffering with her son as he redeemed the world. That's the way she became mother. That's the way she became to love all of us. And we were gifted also with this gift it was given to her because she's our mother. Huh? This is a gift to us. Mary is given to us truly, truly, truly as our spiritual mother. <clears throat> so this is a little address that uh, Chiara Lubick made to the Focolare on May the 21st of 2018. <clears throat> She talks about how this new maternity of Mary, same thing John Paul II said, this new maternity of Mary started at Golgotha, where she died along with her son to be reborn, as it were, through the resurrection to this new maternity. So Kiar Lubick says this. Um, So she was, th years before, back in 1965, she was thinking about Mary and the sufferings that she bore at the foot of the cross. <clears throat> and she said, um, only her being the mother of God could have enabled her to do so much. How else can we explain it? And that's exactly when we were born. That's exactly when we were born. It is there that Jesus made us children of God. And we became children of Mary when Jesus entrusted her to us. We became children of God through the sacrificial death of Christ, right? And Mary became our mother at the same time. We became children of Mary, she says. <clears throat> She says, it is not known whether Mary looked after other people during Jesus' lifetime. It was at the moment of her desolation at the foot of the cross and after her loss of Jesus that a new maternal love was born in her for the apostles and all humanity. In fact, we see her in a role that she did not have before. We find her at the heart of the newborn church awaiting the new descent of the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit worked such wonders in the apostles, transforming them beyond recognition, that very Holy Spirit must have also brought about in Mary a new fullness, which even to this day we do not completely comprehend. And then kind of at the end of this address that Kiara Lubick was making, making on that day. Here's something she said. <clears throat> back in 1949, which is when the movement started, she says, back in 1949, I understood Mary as being very great. Before that time, I had imagined her as the most beautiful creature in the world, whose heart was filled with more love than all the mothers of the world. But then, in 1949, I saw her as immensely great. She is the mother of God. We saw her as being so great. 
that what Jesus asked of the Father is fulfilled in her, love them as you have loved me. And then she said, we want to be like St. Therese. We want to be like St. Therese of the child Jesus who said in the church, my mother, I will be loved. And we would add, in the church, my mother, I will be married. I would say that we want to be a little Mary because Mary was immaculate. She was a queen. She was assumed into heaven. And these little things do not apply to us. Nonetheless, we still want to say, in the church, my mother, I will be Mary. And on another occasion, she said, to love Mary by visiting shrines and taking her flowers is beautiful, but it's not enough. Whereas to have her as a model, to imitate her, because she is the epitome of the church, the epitome for each one of us, <clears throat> is how we show our gratitude to Mary. This is what she really likes. So, I'd like for you to uh, just look momentarily. Oh gosh, I don't know how I'm going to be able to get through this. <laughs> look at this sheet that has some principles of Marian devotion on it. <clears throat> so we should let the portrayal of Mary in the Gospels be our source of inspiration and contemplation. Thirdly, we should allow Mary to be our mother, to love her, to consider ourselves her beloved child. You'll have, you'll have an opportunity to look at this later. I want now to uh, refer to uh, the central part of Teresa's teaching on Mary, a poem that she wrote, which is called, I Love You, Mary. So this is just a few months before Therese would die in May of 1897. She told her sister Celine that she always desired to express her thoughts about the Blessed Virgin Mary. She said to Celine, there's still one thing I have to do before I die. I have always dreamed of singing a song to the Blessed Virgin Mary, expressing everything that I think about her. And so she would basically sing this song of Mary by writing this poem. So we know that Therese wanted to correct these false notions of Mary, that she was upset about the things that she heard some priests say in homilies and so forth and so on about the Blessed Virgin Mary. They often spoke about Mary in a very grandiose manner, as if the Blessed Virgin Mary was so gloriously elevated that she was beyond the reach of mere mortals. They spoke as if Mary was so far removed from the world and human imperfection that she could never be approached worthily by the average person, Therese wanted to correct that. And so she wrote this poem. Let's look at, you've got a copy of the poem there. Uh, let's look at uh, stanza one for a moment, please. Uh, I Stanza one, oh, I would love to sing, Mary, why I love you, why your sweet name thrills my heart, and why the thought of your supreme greatness could not bring fear to my soul. If I gazed on you in your sublime glory, surpassing the splendor of all the blessed, I could not believe that I am your child. Oh, Mary, before you I would lower my eyes. So, uh, Therese knows that Mary does have a, spe a special place in heaven. She's been assumed into heaven. But at the same time, Therese wants to experience Mary's love and express her love for Mary. And she wants there to be a very personal relationship between the mother and her child. 
stanza two. If a child to cherish her, his mother, if a child is to cherish her mother, uh, she has to cry with him and share his sorrows. Sorry. Oh, oh, my dearest mother, on this foreign shore, how many tears you shed to draw me to you. In pondering your life and the Gospels, huh? in pondering your life and the Holy Gospels, then I dare to look at you and come near you. It is not difficult for me to believe I am your child, for I see you human and suffering like us. So the gospel reveals Mary to us as someone who is acquainted with sorrow, someone whose heart was pierced with a lance of sorrow. Um, when, uh, when someone suggested that Mary never had any sufferings, huh? uh, Therese responded to that by saying, and Sister Genevieve, speaks about this. She spoke to me about a letter of a priest who said the Blessed Virgin Mary didn't know physical suffering from actual experience. And Therese said, when I was looking at the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary this evening, I understood this wasn't true. I understood that she suffered not only in soul, but also in her body. She suffered a lot on her journey from the cold and the heat and from fatigue. She fasted very frequently. Yes, she knew how to suffer. Let's go to... Uh, let's see. Let's go to stanza... Let's go to stanza six, okay? You make me feel that it's not impossible to follow in your footsteps. O queen of the elect, you made visible the narrow road to heaven while always practicing the humblest virtues. Near you, Mary, I like to stay little. I see the vanity of greatness here below. In the home of St. Elizabeth, receiving your visit, I learn how to practice ardent charity. So this stanza six is one of the import most important stanzas in the poem. It tells us about the simplicity of the Blessed Virgin Mary and about how Mary's simplicity makes it possible for anyone to imitate her. She says, you made visible the narrow road to heaven while always practicing the humblest virtues, end of quote. Therese says, and here we should turn, let's turn to one of her last conversations on August the 21st of 1897. Therese says, <clears throat> Therese says how I would have loved to be a priest in order to preach about the Blessed Virgin Mary. One sermon would be sufficient to say everything I think about her life. We shouldn't say unlikely things or things that we don't know anything about. For example, that when she was very little at the age of three, the Blessed Virgin Mary went to the temple to offer herself to God. Again, why say, with reference to the aged Simeon's prophetic words, that the Blessed Virgin Mary had the passion of Jesus constantly before her mind from that moment onward, and the sword will pierce your soul also, the old man had said. <coughs> For a sermon on the Blessed Virgin Mary to please me and to do any good, I must see her real life, not her imagined life. I am sure that her real life was very simple. They show her to us as unapproachable, but they should present her as imitable, bringing out her virtues, saying that she lived by faith, just like we ourselves, giving proofs of this, from the Gospels where we read and they did not understand the words which were spoken to them and that no less mysterious statement his father and mother marveled at what was said of him 
This admonition presupposes a certain surprise, don't you think so, little mother? And in her last conversations, uh, she says that Mary wanted nothing more than to live by faith just like us. Let's go to stanza 12. <clears throat> o Queen of Martyrs, till the evening of your life, that sorrowful sword will pier pierce your heart. Already you must leave your native land to flee a king's jealous fury. Jesus sleeps in peace under the folds of your veil. Joseph comes begging you to leave at once. And at once your obedience is revealed. You leave without delay or reasoning. So the deep sorrow, a uh, sort of sorrow, would enter into Mary's heart during the passion of her son, but sorrow would accompany Mary all through her human life. Sorrow came very quickly into her life after the birth of her son. For she and Joseph would have to flee to Egypt since King Herod had the intention of killing the child Jesus. Stanza 12 focuses on Mary's obedience to the pleas of Joseph that they leave very quickly to safeguard the child. We know that Joseph had received a message in a dream and he had to be obedient to the angel. Mary, for her part, must trust Joseph's spiritual intuition and be obedient to him. Therese loves Mary because she is obedient without any delay or any reasoning. Go to uh, stanza 17. <clears throat> Mary, full of grace, I know that in Nazareth you live in poverty, wanting nothing more, no rapture, miracle, or ecstasy embellish your life. O queen of the elect, the number of little ones on earth is truly great. They can raise their eyes to you without trembling. It is by the ordinary way, incomparable mother, that you like to walk to guide them to heaven. The ordinary way Mary has walked. Um, this is the ordinary way that you and I need to walk if we're going to find our way to heaven because there's very little chance that we'll receive any miracle or any rapture or anything spectacular like that. God does work in various ways. And, you know, if you examine your life, you'll probably find a miracle or two, but it's not an, an everyday experience or anything like that. We need to be like Mary. Mary was a person of faith. Mary didn't necessarily have all kinds of locutions and raptures and visions and so forth and so on. She lived an ordinary life of faith, so Therese would tell us. And that's the way that Vatican II presents her to us as well. Um, let's see. I'm coming to the end of my time here, so I don't uh, actually... Let's see, let's, uh, let's go to stanza 23, okay? Because there we have this new maternity of Mary coming about, huh? She's at the foot of the cross. <clears throat> let's see. 
history. Yes. Mary at the top of Calvary, standing beside the cross. To, to me, you seem like a priest at the altar, offering your beloved Jesus, the sweet Emmanuel, to appease the Father's justice. A prophet said, O oh, afflicted mother, there is no sorrow like your sorrow. O oh, queen of martyrs, while remaining in exile, you lavish on us the blood of your heart. It's as though Mary is pouring out her own blood uh, from the cross in order to adopt us as her spirit, spiritual children. Um, let's see. Actually, that idea of Mary being united with us and acting as a priest, as it were, huh? pouring out the blood of Jesus on the world, that's what happens when we celebrate the Mass. Truly, we have communion in the Paschal mystery of Jesus. We offer this perfect gift to the Father, and what happens? The very body and blood of Christ are given to us. There is, even though we may not recognize it, there is a mystical, spiritual fusion between ourselves and Jesus. We truly receive His flesh. And in receiving His flesh, Guess what? It enters into our flesh. It said in Genesis, the two shall become one flesh. Well, there's a, certain, there's a real sense in which that happens in the Eucharist. And priests are very much like Mary at the foot of the cross, extending this sacrifice into the world. In fact, the American bishop said as much in a document on the priesthood that was published in November of 1973. <clears throat> in uh, number 120, the bishops say, his, that is the priest's, the priest's distinct calling to be a fellow worker with Christ bears a resemblance to Mary's unique association in the saving work of Jesus. Our Lady's relationship to Christ, the eternal high priest, overflows into her spiritual motherhood of all priests in their call to holiness and mystery. Well, let's go to stanza 25 and we'll, find, oh, we'll finish with that. Soon I'll hear the sweet harmony. Soon I'll go to beautiful heaven to see you. You who came to smile at me in the morning of my life, come smile at me again, mother. It is evening now. I no longer fear the splendor of your supreme glory. With you I've suffered, and now I want to sing on your lap, Mary, why I love you, and to go on saying that I am your child. <clears throat> so it's good to remember here that this is, this is cost Therese to write this poem. Why? Because she's in her last illness. This is just months before her death. So she's basically on her deathbed. <clears throat> and, though, and, and she's suffering a great deal physically and also spiritually because she entered a night of faith where it seemed like heaven was no, no longer existed. And she lived for heaven all her life, but now it is as though heaven was out of sight and, and, and she, she had a night of faith within which she wondered whether there even was a heavenly life. Okay, so, <clears throat> even though her spirit is in darkness, She's living in hope, as we can see from this stanza, 
She's living in hope of the day that is coming swiftly <clears throat> when she will be born into eternity and come to see the people she longed to meet there. Second only to Jesus, Therese is anticipating meeting the Blessed Virgin Mary and so she says, soon I'll go to heaven to see you. You who came to smile at me in the morning of my life, come smile again, mother. It's evening now, and now all I want is to sing on your lap, Mary, why I love you. <clears throat> well, Therese loved Mary because Mary had shown the pathway of faith to Therese. Mary had shared her virtues with Therese, and Mary had shown herself to be a loving mother to Therese again and again. Still, as she lay dying, Therese was sure that her experience of the motherhood of Mary was going to be even more profound in heaven. And this is shown by a letter to Genevieve of February the 23rd, 1896, where Therese said, quote, I know the Blessed Virgin Mary will become the mama of her privileged child in a more intimate and motherly way than in the past. I know that poor little Therese already feels in her heart a joy so great at the thought of the beautiful day soon to begin that she is wondering what she will feel when it actually arrives. Well, Therese would say that moment can arrive for us if we live a life of faith and imitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, if we are aware of the presence of Christ among us, if we strive to develop virtue in imitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, if we go to her in times of trouble, because we all need a mother's consolation, if we go to her in time of trouble, we are assured, we are assured of her maternal, merciful love. We can ever have every confidence in her. That is Therese's teaching. And so we come to the end.